Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, uh, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning. Man, it is a great day. My name is Chris. I serve here as the family pastor, uh, and I'm excited to be here with you this morning. We've got a great morning planned. If you guys don't know what today is, uh, today is Palm Sunday, which is a really big uh, kind of faith marker in the Christian faith. Palm Sunday uh, signifies the day by which Jesus uh, kind of rides on a donkey into Jerusalem, uh, really riding into the city where he is about to die. And on the way in, they kind of celebrate him as a king. They, they throw down palm branches and, and robes, as was pretty much custom for when royalty would walk into a city, uh, not, not knowing, the crowd not knowing that five days later, they would be chanting and cheering for his execution. And so this begins what the Christian faith often calls Passion Week. It's a week where Jesus' last words are said uh, on earth, and all those things are very important markers for our faith. But imagine with me for a second the people who are standing on Palm Sunday watching Jesus walk in. Like imagine the stories that they had to tell. Imagine what they told their kids. Imagine what they told their relatives or their families. Imagine what they told for, for decades. Like my dad was at Palm Sunday. That's crazy. Like we have these markers in our lives, these moments that create memories, that create stories that trigger for us things for us to tell people. Maybe, maybe they're physical markers, something like a cast or a sling. Somebody looks at that and goes, what happened there? Right, or maybe it's, maybe it's a scar or a limp, something physical like that. Or, or maybe it's like a, a bandage or a Band-Aid. And at the end of all that, right, somebody looks at you and goes, man, what happened to you? We've been in this series called Story, and we've been talking about kind of these, these big things, like one, do you know your story? Two, uh, can you share your story? And, and story in relation to like our story with God, like our interaction with God, our relationship with God. So today I get the opportunity to talk about how do we live our story in such a way that somebody wants to ask a question about it. As somebody wants to go, something's different about you. How do we do that? So I want to take some time this morning and do that. I remember when Aiden was one years old, he had this really neat helmet that he got to wear. I think we got a picture of it. There it is. Look at him go. I know. He's not that small anymore. It's really sad. But anyway, apparently, um, so we tried to follow all the rules. First time parents, like, don't let your kids sleep on their stomach. Like, all the crazy stuff. We had Aiden swaddled like a fool. That could, he couldn't move. I don't know how it's comfortable for a baby, but apparently it, like, reminds him of the womb. Whatever. I don't care. At the end of the day... Aiden was a hard, and still is, a hard sleeper. That dude would sleep through a machine gun fight. It's amazing. The bad thing for his head, apparently, is if you sleep on your back like that as a baby, it kind of creates like a flat spot on the back of your noggin. And so we had to put this cool football helmet on Aiden that he got to walk around. And of course, everybody, when you see a kid with anything, they're like, what happened? What, what happened to the kid? Like, oh, he's fine. He just likes football. It's fine. Like, <laughs> get over it. So we'd have to tell everybody, like, oh, he has a flat spot. And I said, and this is supposed to help round his head back out and blah, blah, blah. It's whatever. 
We all have these kind of markers where people ask us what's different. And that's what I want to talk about today. What I want to talk about is to kind of get close to Easter, it's a week away, is how do we live our story in such a way that people ask us, like, something, something's not the same with you. What's up with that? So let's get into that. I want to look at our key passage we've looked at over the last couple of weeks in 1 Peter chapter 1. But if you have a Bible, I would love for you to flip to Ephesians chapter 4 and John chapter 13. Just kind of keep your fingers plugged in both of those spots. If you don't have a Bible, to pull one out of the chair in front of you and use that today. I'll have some on the screen as well, but it's always good to write, scribble, color, do whatever you want to within the Bible to help create markers so you can remember what we're talking about. So first, I'm going to read this passage, then we're going to jump to Ephesians 4. Uh, so this one will be on the screen. It says this, uh, 1 Peter 3.15, Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Now, that's where we're going to land today. When somebody asks you, be ready to explain it. But here's the real question. Why should an unbelieving world ask you about your story? Like, why should a world who aren't Christians ask you about your story? How do we make that happen? Is there a way forward in there? I would say yes. Because here's the thing. All of us are wired up as story-based people. We love stories. We're born into stories. We're raised hearing stories. We die with stories. Like, stories is part of our culture. It's in our DNA. People love stories. The single best way to comprehend the Christian faith and how we are to live a faithful life is to understand that we are a character in a greater story. And we're going to talk about that a lot more next week. Your life, your goal is to be a character in God's greater story for you. So, How do we take our story and live it in a way that people ask us about it? Well, I want to look at Ephesians 4, but let me first, let me just tell you that I am about to plagiarize something, so you can't tell me that I'm plagiarizing it because I just told you I'm plagiarizing it. So that that makes it free now, right? Like, I can do that. It's fine. So Apple had a really great ad back in like 1998. Steve Jobs had just got hired back onto Apple. He wanted to set the groundwork for what Apple was going to look like now as this mega, you know, billion-dollar company. But they ran this ad in 1998. It was absolutely brilliant. It was one of the greatest ads in television history, I believe. And they ran this ad, and this is all it was. They got to the very end of it all. It was like pictures of Gandhi and uh, Mother Teresa and all these things. At the very end, it was just two simple words. and just said, be different. How do people ask you, or why should people ask you about your story? How do we make that happen? You're different than everybody else. We're called to be different than everybody else. Let's take a look at what Paul says. Ephesians chapter 4. I think this is really good stuff. Check this out. He says, Therefore I, Paul, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling, uh, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. So I I love what Paul is getting after here. Let me give you a little bit of context as to what's happening. Paul is sitting in prison in Rome, and and here's the thing, man. I I think where the Roman Empire got it wrong was in an attempt to, to keep Christians quiet, they put them in prison. The problem was there's not much to do in prison, so they just wrote a whole bunch of letters. Hashtag the New Testament. So Paul is like, well, I got nothing else to do. Hey, uh, guard, you mind give me some papyrus real quick? I just want to scribble down a couple of notes called the Bible. It's fine. So that's what he does. He's sitting in prison. He's bored out of his mind, probably. He writes down this book, this letter to the church at Ephesus. Paul planted this church about 10 or 15 years before he wrote this letter. He had spent a lot of time there multiple years. The book of Acts records at least three to four years that Paul spent in Ephesus, which is a really long time for Paul. He was kind of a nomad. He didn't really stay in one place very long. So for him to stay at a church that long was pretty crazy. But he loved this church. He wanted to write this letter in an attempt to kind of just encourage them, like, hey, you've been called to something incredible. Live like it. That doesn't mean 
that you had to be in prison, right? We don't equate Christianity with prison. That's not what we're saying. But what Paul's saying is, do these characteristics, these characteristics are what, are what you are called to live to set yourself apart from the world. So here's what he does, right? Look at, look at what he says. He says, look, uh, sorry, he says, be humble, be gentle, be patient, be forgiving, uh, be united, be peacemakers. Why? Because of your love for each other and your love for God. Look, here's the question I've, I've wrestled with for years. I've, I've been in ministry 13 years now, and I just wonder, how is it that Jesus was able to draw crowds, and yet the churches aren't? I know, I don't like that question either. But I just wonder, why is it that Jesus had so many following him, and yet our churches, most of them in this America, especially, are flailing. And I wonder if we've lost the sense of what Jesus has called us to be. So let's look at four characteristics. I want to give you four super easy practical truths. My goal today is not to dig down so deep that I'm getting like Peter's original words that he spoke to his mother-in-law. I'm not trying to get that deep today. I want to give us four really practical, really tangible things that you can walk out of this room today and do to set yourself apart from everybody else, to cause people to wonder why are you different than everybody else. So let's look at the first one. The first one is love. Now look, I told you, I promised you at the beginning, we weren't going to go super deep. I'm trying to keep it basic, but I think we missed this one, and it's the easiest one. But love, look at John 13, 35. It's going to be on the screen. If you have it already plugged in your, uh, on your Bible, it'd be great. But if not, it's on there. It says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Now, why does that matter? Well, it's, it's easy, right? If we are loving other people instead of yelling at other people, then we're setting a different standard than the rest of the world. The world tells us, like, get ahead, get everybody else beneath you. But Jesus is like, no, 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 no. We're not putting everybody beneath us. We're going to love everybody even if they're not like us. Doesn't mean we go hang out with them, become best friends with every single person, but it does mean we display the love of Jesus to them. And this is a key way to get people to ask, how are you different, right? When you live a life full of love, when you do these things that Paul said, right? Be humble, be gentle, be patient, be forgiving, be peacemakers, be united. When we do these things, people are like, hold up. What's up with you? Why are you different? People want to know because it's countercultural. Look, when I give my kids something, more often than not, I'll hand them something and they'll be like, why'd you give me this? I'm like, well, because I love you. I'm like, okay, cool. And they walk off, right? They don't ever say thank you because kids are the worst. <laughs> I love you, kids. Here's the thing. We do this really cool project every summer called Jerusalem Project. We take our students, 6th through 12th graders, we load them up in cars, and we drive them all over Glen Burnie and Arundel County. And we get them to do different service projects. It's like better together, but a little bit bigger, a week long. It's craziness. We serve nonprofits. We serve local schools. We do everything to kind of do it better together, just on a bigger scale for a week long uh, adventure. And we take all of our 6th through 8th graders, or 6th through 12th graders and do that. And this year, I think we have like 7 or 8 churches joining us. After last year, they're like, hey, we want to do that too. I was like, great, let's do it. But here's the thing. On one day, on Wednesday... We go to all of our local business, or all of our local donut shops, and we say, we want to buy all your donuts today. Like, whatever you were about to sell, we want to buy them from you. And then we're going we're gonna to promote you. We're going to put your little sticker on there. And then we're going to go, and we're going to take them, and we're going to give those donuts out. And we put a little sticker on there. It says, like, ACC loves you, and so does Jesus. We hand that to people at local businesses all over Anne Arundel County. Last year, we went up and down Ritchie Highway and Crane High this way. This year, we're going to expand even further because we have more people. So we're talking like a couple hundred dozen donuts will be scattered all throughout Anne Arundel County this year. And we coach, our student, we coach our students before they go out. We tell them, hey, when you hand this to people, nine out of ten people are going to be like, what are you doing? Why are you giving me these donuts? Right? And we coach them like, oh, because we just want to display the love of Jesus in a tangible way. Now, if they look at you and they're mad, understand that something is right. If donuts don't make you happy, church, I tell the students, if, if you walk in and they're still mad, you pray right away. Come out here, we need to lay hands on you. There's a demon in you. We need to pray this out of you. And then, 
And then we'll talk, I'm, I'm 100% convinced, church, that the Hebrew word in the Old Testament for manna was glazed donut. It may, may be chocolate covered, but definitely glazed donut. And that's, that's why I'm still to this day amazed. Like, why were the Israelites so mad that they were eating Dunkin' Donuts? It's fine. So anyways, we get to all of that. We circle it out. We hand them these donuts. We tell them we want to give these to them as an expression of our love for Jesus in a tangible way. And the look on people's faces uh, what are you doing? Why would you do this? It's easy. We can all do that. You don't have to take a dozen donuts to your coworkers. I'm not saying that. But we can all do tangible things to set ourselves apart from somebody else. We can do things that display love that other people wouldn't do. You can sit and listen to people. You can sit and talk to people. You can maybe buy somebody a cup of coffee. Somebody doesn't have a lunch. Like, hey, let me get your lunch today. Why would you do that? I just want to display the love of Jesus to you in a tangible way. So first and foremost, love. Secondly, we should serve. We should serve. Now, I want to kind of dig into this one a little bit. In John 13, there's this really cool passage. We learned about it last week at, at our weekend retreat. The speaker came in and he talked about this, and I want to talk about it this morning because I think it's important. In John 13, Jesus is, is kind of at the beginning of this Passion Week, and he, as they walk into the room, Jesus tells all of his disciples, as was custom, to sit down, and they were, he was going to wash their feet. Now, that part was not custom. Often, in this culture, when a husband would come home, his wife would wash his feet, the kids might wash his feet, or the lowest servant would wash the feet of whoever visitors or whoever else would come into the house. And so, uh, for when you would come into like the temple the, you know, to learn from your rabbi, which is what Jesus was considered in this day, normally the disciples would be the one to wash his feet. And so Jesus says, no, no, no we're going to do it differently. I'm going to wash your feet. It's a flip of the script. This is the turning point in Jesus' ministry. It's pivotal. He has this massive role reversal where he says, no, no, I'm going to wash, I'm going to wash your feet instead of you washing mine. And here's what's even crazier to me. Jesus washes his, Judas washes his. Jesus washes Judas' feet. The dude who's about to betray him, Jesus washes his feet. Some people look at me like, man, I can't love that dude. I can't love that girl. You don't know what they've done to me. I'm not asking you to be their best friend. I'm asking you to love them like Jesus would. And Jesus would wash their feet. Even somebody who betrayed him. So he serves them. Look at verse 12 in John 13. He says, after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. He's explained to us that we need to become the least so that he becomes the greatest. John says it again in chapter 20. He says, I must decrease so that he can increase. So I just wonder, are we serving in tangible ways? Maybe that means serving here at ACC, and that's great. Maybe serving at another nonprofit somewhere else, and that's great too. I don't know what you're doing with your life, but at some level we have to serve. And I'm talking like easy things. Maybe it's cleaning up the, the lunchroom, right? Like maybe you have a bunch of slobs at your workplace, so you clean the fridge. Like, I don't want to clean the fridge. They're all nasty. Great. Not the attitude we're looking for, right? We are serving, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's gross. For students, right, it's going into school and picking up lunch trays, picking up trash, doing things that are different than what everybody else is doing. Look, if everybody else is walking by that piece of trash, pick it up. Why? Why should everybody else did it? Great. We're not called to be like everybody else. We're called to be different. We're called to be set apart. So do something that looks different than what everybody else is doing. Here's the thing. Here's the question that Will asked our students. He said, if we are constantly asking, how can I serve you? Guess what that's going to do in response? If I'm always asking you, how can I serve you? 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 You're going to in turn be like, whoa, 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 whoa. How can I serve you? I'm like, no, no, no. How can I serve you? And if we go back and forth like this, guess what? Everybody getting served. You're welcome. That was free. <laughs> Just making sure you're listening this morning, that's all. Everybody gets served at that point, right? The church gets served. Our, our community gets served because we're constantly asking the question, how can I serve you? Nobody asks that question. 
But we should. It should be different. So thirdly, I want to go back to Ephesians for just a second and read the cool end to this kind of paragraph that Paul writes. In verse 14, he says this, Then we, if we do all these things, will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that sound like the truth. Instead, check this out, here we go. We will speak the truth in love and grow in every way more and more like Christ. The church. So Paul says to speak, right? And he tells us to speak the truth in love. So how do we do that? I think it's less about picket signs and more about praying. I think it's less about yelling and more about genuinely showing affection for other people. And maybe that means praying for people in public. Maybe that means like praying at lunch or praying at dinner. Maybe it's praying just at home with your kids. Your kids ask, hey, why are we praying? Why do we do this? Maybe it's inviting people. We have Easter coming up. Like, hey, I think you should come to Easter with me. Why? I don't know, because I think it's cool, and I'll buy you mission afterwards. Hey, just as a side note, missions close on Sunday, so do it. It's easy. You can get them here, and you don't have to pay for them. <laughs> Sorry, if you're watching online, you should still come to our Easter if they tell you that. Sorry, I forgot we record this one. It means being willing to tell your story when people ask, right? It means calling out people's sin in their lives and not leaving them after you do it. I'm going to say that one again because I feel like we could miss it. It means calling out people's sin in their lives and not leaving them after. Walking with them as we restore them. Speaking the truth in love means you build a relationship, you build trust, you have credibility in people's lives. I'll give you an example of this. We, um, back in 2010, I was working at a church in South Carolina at the time. I'd been there for a few years at this point. And we had a student, an 18-year-old student, get killed in a car wreck. He got thrown from the car and, and killed immediately. <clears throat> 18 years old, wanted to be a missionary. Incredible young man who I loved and adored. Many people loved and adored. Um, his funeral was standing room only in an auditorium of uh, over 1,000. It was unbelievable. And I, I was honored to be a part of his life. A year before that, though, um, I was sitting at breakfast with um, one of my seminary professors in Travers Rest, South Carolina, and we were eating breakfast together. And one of the things he, he does before every meal, and I think this is really neat, and I'm, I don't do it as much as I should, um, but this is what he does before every meal. He looks at the waiter, the waitress says, hey, we're going to pray before our meal. Is there something we can pray for you about? There's something going on that we can pray for you. Because we're going to pray either way. We just, if you want to be included or not, that's great. Like, we're going to pray for you either way, but... And this, this uh, young girl looked back at us, and she's like, yeah, there is. This place is about to close down. I don't have a job. I don't know what I'm going to do next. I'm really lost. I have no hope here, really, because nothing's working in my favor. If you could just pray for me, that'd be great. So she sat down, and, and me and, and my professor, we got to pray for her. And then she went about her business, we went about our business, and they, uh, they closed down, and I never saw her again until a year later. I walk into Josh's family's house. I go to meet with his mother and his family to talk to them about the funeral. I walk into Josh's house, and there's his sister, the same girl that a year ago we had prayed for. And just the fact that God had lined that up was pretty incredible. But she looked at me, and she's like, you prayed for me a year ago. Do you remember that? And I was like, yeah, sure. We, we, you know, I remember the store that closed, you know, closing down, like whatever happened. She's like, it was incredible. After you prayed for me, I had hope. It's like, I got a job. I'm not, you know what I mean? Like, everything worked out. It's like, I can't thank you enough for giving me just that small bit of hope that day that God was going to do something. I was like, yeah, sure. But it also built that credibility and trust that now that I'm talking to their family in one of the darkest days of their lives, like they, can, they can have hope and trust that, that I'm going to speak into their lives well. So it's important that we speak. We use our words. Maybe it's going through Starbucks and be like, hey, I'm going to pray for my coffee. I know that's weird. I always pray for my coffee. I want to pray for you. Is there anything you're going on I can pray for you about? Maybe it's at lunch, breakfast, whatever. Take time to do that. On the inverse of this, though, I think sometimes it's important that we're silent. I think sometimes it's important that we don't talk at all. So what I mean. 
There's this cool Jewish tradition. That whenever somebody would die, whenever there was a, a moment of grieving, they would have this week-long uh, thing called sitting shiva. What they would do is the, the family would be in their house and their, fam- their friends, close relatives, would come and sit with them. If the family was quiet, they would be quiet. If the family would talk, they would talk. The family would laugh, they would laugh. The family would cry, they would cry. If the family asked them to do anything, they would go and do it. It's just a means of being with people. Sometimes our greatest witness is in our, not even in our words. It's in our presence. Sometimes we just need to be still and listen as people pour out their hearts. Not try to fix it. Not try to pound them with the Bible. But just let them know, hey, I'm here for you. I'm in your corner, and I love you. Sometimes we have to speak. Last one. It's back in Ephesians 4. I'm going to read it one more time. Ephesians 4.15, Paul says, Not only do we speak the truth in love, but we grow in every way more and more like Christ. Now, I think this is kind of where he lands his, his most important argument. Because here's the deal. If we are going to display hope and love to somebody, then we have to have it ourselves. If we don't have it ourselves, if we're not growing, then we have nothing to give out of. We ought to love and care for people out of the abundance of the love that we've experienced through Jesus. And so Paul says here, do you even have the hope to start with? He's like, we, we grow, but only because we're pursuing God. So the last thing would be to pursue. So not only should we love, not only should we speak, not only should we serve, but we should pursue because it's out of our growth in who Jesus is that we are able to grow as well. At the end of, at the end of it all, people have to, are only going to ask us about the hope we have if we have any hope to start with. And so maybe that's where you need to start today. Maybe you need to start by just going, I don't have any hope. I don't know what any of that means, but I want it. And that's what this is all about. That's why we do what we do week in and week out. I love this passage in Galatians 2. Galatians 2, it says, My, my old self, this is Paul writing again to the church in Galatia, it says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live on this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, Paul's saying this. We ought to hide ourselves behind the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. That you and I are called to not love, serve, and speak out of our own abilities, but rather love, serve, and speak out of the overflow of what Jesus has already done on our behalf. We are a storytelling culture, a storytelling people that follow a storytelling God. When people ask us, we say, well, let me tell you the story about how God did this incredible thing. Let me tell you the story about how God did this incredible thing. But this season, I want to encourage you to, instead of deflecting, to say, let me tell you my story. Let me tell you the story about what God did in my life and how he changed me. We've encouraged you to not just know your story, but to share your story, to put it up online, to allow everybody to hear your story. And I want to encourage you, when people ask you about the hope that you have within you, that you share your story. We always like to end with kind of this, what now? What do we do now? And I want to end with some introspective questions, some questions for you and I today to think about and to consider as we leave this place. Number one, are you the same person here that you are outside of work? Are you the same person here you are at work? Think about that for a second. Like, how do you treat your coworkers? How do you treat your friends? How you, like, is it the same across the board? Are you the same person outside of work? Do you live differently around different peer groups. Think about it. Are you the same with your family that you are with your friends, that you are with your coworkers? Like, how do you live? Are you living differently or not? And does your environment determine your speech or is it consistent no matter what? If you wonder why people aren't asking you what your story is, there's a good chance it's because you're not living any differently than them. People don't want to know why you're doing the same things as them. They want to know why you're different. I think the best question you can get is the one that ends with, 
why aren't you doing that like everybody else? I'll tell you why I'm not doing that. I'm glad you asked. Why aren't you drinking like everybody else? Why don't you party like everybody else? Why aren't you having sex like everybody else? Why aren't you living with your partner like everybody else? Why aren't you doing this like everybody else? This is acceptable, right? This is the cultural norm. Yeah, yeah, it might be the cultural norm, but I think God's a lot bigger than our culture. So we allow culture to define our God. I want to encourage you to allow God to define your culture. I want to say that again. I, I think we oftentimes allow culture to define our God. And I want to encourage you to allow God to define your culture. Because whether you realize it or not, people are watching. And I just wonder if, if like the people on Palm Sunday did, telling their story, celebrating a king, I wonder, are we as excited to share our story about what Jesus has done in our lives to allow people to ask us for the hope that's within us. Will you love? Will you serve? Will you speak? Will you pursue Jesus? Church, I think if we do those things, the culture will have no other response than to ask us, why are you so different? Will you pray with me? Jesus, I ask today that you would be a a force to be reckoned with in this church. God, that we would pray and beg that you would provide opportunities for us to share our story. I pray that each person in this room would get a chance, an opportunity to share why you are so important to them. And God, if there's even one in this room who would say, he's not. God's not important to me. God, I pray, I beg that they would not leave this church without getting right, without figuring it out, without asking the questions, without seeking out the joy and the hope that is within us. Jesus, I pray that you would use ACC in a mighty way to be life changers in this community, in this county, in the state, and all around this world. God, may we be excited about the hope that is within us. And may people see it and ask questions about it. And may we be ready to give a defense of what we believe. God, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, please remember, you belong at ACC.